Right lads, uh, today is a little bit of a different video. Now I was planning on scripting this fully and uh, well doing it not live, but I figured uh, this is the best way for me to get all of my thoughts across because whenever I script a video, I record all the audio, go back and think, damn I really wish I'd put that thing or that other thing in. So today I'm going to be highlighting some of the areas in Victoria 3 that I think personally uh, need changing or tweaking, as well as sometimes suggesting alternatives or different changes or something like that that I would personally like to see, as well as my own audience, because of course I asked everyone on the community tab, I don't know why I said of course, I asked uh, some people on the community tab what they thought and a lot of these thoughts are formed from some of those opinions. So what credentials do I have to be commenting on this game? Well, technically, if you look at the Steam uh, charts for the people who have played it the most, I would be in the top 10 if my hours were public. So that's that. <laughs> I've played this game quite a bit. Now, have I played it to the full meta? Uh, no, because obviously I'm trying to make uh, videos. Pretty much all of my playtime happen uh, with recording sessions, so there's that. Also, I'm not a game developer. I know very little about coding, so a lot of the suggestions may be simply impossible. I'm not trying to say how to make a best game. I'm trying to highlight some of the issues that I think there are in the game and what I think that could be done to change them. Could, is that feasible? Is that not? So on screen now should appear all of the little uh, categories as I've defined them uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. I think also it's worth mentioning that a lot of these categories will bleed into each other because that's just the nature of the game. So first up, we're just going to be looking at pure flavor. Uh, how do I define flavor? Flavor for me is depth of gameplay. That's uh, stuff that's unique to a nation or uh, something that happens more dynamically. So for example, if we look at Austria here, we have the matter of Hungary. Uh, we also have German unification because it's localized in this area. If I switch on over to the United States, we have a similar bit of flavor. We have the slavery debate, Texan statehood. I mean, Texas itself has a little bit of flavor as well. Uh, as well as this other stuff. The other potential journal entries, because journal entries are sort of, in my opinion, the main way that this game gets across different bits of flavor, are all not really relevant to specific nations. For example, the whaling industry or the steam engine time or something like that are all sort of almost triggered modifiers if you play U4. Uh, what that means is that if you hit a certain threshold or you do a certain thing, then that thing will trigger. It's mildly dynamic, but it is sort of not unique, if that makes sense. Um, by the way, throughout this entire thing, I want you to timestamp or things that you agree with or disagree with and put in the comments how you think things should be changed. When I talk about dynamic flavor, I don't just mean, oh, uh, flavor events for this nation or specific to Egypt or this sort of stuff. I mean also in terms of how they interact. For example, if I, as Egypt, uh, have been trading with the two Sicilies for a long time, we have a trade agreement, maybe that should factor into something. Maybe we should have increased cooperation. Maybe I get um, a uh, more migration from them. Maybe I my laws are easier to pass if they emulate their laws. These kinds of interactions, I think, should happen because it will create a more immersive environment to exist in. Because right now, it doesn't matter which nation is targeting you. Like, you're not fearful or excited or worried about anything um, when it comes... If you just see Great Britain in a game, you don't... That, that could be interchanged with Austria or France. It doesn't matter um, unless, obviously, one is ridiculously strong. There's not anything like... You don't build a story, if that makes sense. And I think that's a key part coming in. One of the reasons why I haven't gotten bored of this game is because I record it and I come at it with uh, a sort of imposed storyline. I'm going to be forming this nation. I'm going to be doing that. And that's because I force it through. If I'm playing as the two Sicilies and I've been allied to Austria the entire time, or I've been periodically fighting France, then France can turn around and like me. And it's just, there's no like lingering sense of, of history. Uh, and that ruins it. Something like, for example, CK3, or EU4, you'll have long-standing rivalries. You'll have individuals that will come after you and your family in CK3. You'll have um, these massive wars or like they, or like uh, your allies won't ally uh, your rivals. And it, it makes it feel more immersive. And right now, this each nation feels bland uh, in terms of how you interact with them. It doesn't matter whether it's Egypt or Ottomans or anything else. There's no flavor each nation within your interactions with them or indeed their interactions with anyone else. Going in a bit deeper, I've played this game uh, for a very, very long time, this specific game. I don't care about this guy. I don't care about the party leaders. I don't, I don't remember any of them. Um, and I think that is a bit of a failure on the game's part. I think that these individual leaders, and I'll talk about it a little bit more when I talk about governments, but these individual leaders, generals and everything else, beyond having traits, they need to do stuff in the nation. And they do, there are some events to do with that, uh, but I don't, like, it's not immersive enough for me to care oh man, hey, what about this incredible guy? Or like be sad when they die and that sort of stuff, which I think is, is, is necessary for a game like this. Uh, when you're introducing characters, those characters have to do something to make you um, 
like them or dislike them. I'm not thinking like CK3 levels of, of immersion, but they do need something, especially if you're introducing traits. Also on a minor note, what you can do, for example, as the United States of America, or anyone else that has like the, the prerequisites, you can take decisions to do expeditions. And I think these are great because this was a, a time period where uh, everyone was really excited for new discoveries, if you're able to find new things or do new things. And I think that could be a really nice uh, way forward in terms of flavor. If, for example, I'm playing as Belgium and I want to develop my nation to be the nation that goes out and discovers things and everyone likes me because I'm this prestigious, super like tech advanced nation that is going to go around um, and instead of like colonizing, we're going to explore stuff. It creates your own culture within that. And that is a hard system to create gameplay wise. But I think looking at it from a mechanical point of view, things like bonuses to uh, text that help expeditions, if you are going to introduce it as a new newer mechanic, uh, would help to develop, again, that culture within the nation. A lot of these points that I'm going to talk about from now onwards are going to revolve around creating legacies and cultures within a nation, because there's nothing more satisfying than playing a game for 50 years, 100 years, and having the decisions you made previously impact you, uh, not just on like an economic or, or military uh, level. It makes you feel like you're actually inhabiting a nation. Because that's what immersion is. It's culture uh, within the game and it's lasting impacts within the game. Right, we're going to take uh, this as an example. Ignore the uh, absolute French dominance. This is, of course, from my French video where I just conquered the world as France because they're ridiculously overpowered. Produced war. I'm going to look at warfare. A lot of people hate this system and I do understand it, though I don't think it is the worst possible thing. I think there are horrible things within it, but I don't think it is the worst. So the first thing I want to say is that the garrison system i really dislike it i don't like the fact that this guy just because he was summoned from new england can't be moved over up here right or for example the ships that were done in this province and not in this one are suddenly part of that navy and you there's nothing that you can do about it i guess i kind of understand it from a mechanical point of view but it, i just really hate the idea that there are troops that you can't use or troops that you have to use because they're done in a certain location that's at this point not really how things were done as much obviously you had different uh, headquarters, of course you did, but they weren't like prevented from going places. Um, and that stems, for example, from naval invasions. If I wanted to do a naval invasion uh, over here, I can only send Daniel Wheeler because we're from the same headquarters. But that doesn't make a lick of sense to me because why can't I just take these guys and send them? I mean, I'm going halfway across the world either way. Why can't I go and send them over here? You know, it's, it's a little bit strange to me that it's, it's so locked in that just because a general is in one place or, a, or an admiral is in another place, they have to come from the same place in order to launch a naval invasion in tandem. It's a little bit confusing to me. Okay, so of course we have to talk about the frontline system because I think personally this is the, or at least one of the worst features in the game in its current state and the most frustrating feature. The best way I can show you how it works and how like it's so broken isn't just showing, oh, well, I've been split into two, now I'm in a tricky situation if I only have one general. For example, if I was playing as the Sikh Empire and I only had one general and the front line split into two, then I can only put all of my troops in one line and not the other. So I just get completely ravaged. So I've gone ahead and given myself 110 million uh, radicals. And let's do something that's really gonna piss off everyone like this. Uh, well, this is a perfect example, actually. Uh, I don't need to do a revolution, but look, this nation can't contend with all of my vassals because look at the sheer amount of front lines there are. There is a front line here and an individual one here, right? They can't physically put all their troops everywhere. So as uh, India, you're safe from any sort of revolt. So moreover, one thing that can happen, and it happened to me as Texas, which is why I'm playing as Texas now, just to visualize it, is that we could be at war with Mexico, right? And Mexico can push in over here a little bit. And then when I fight my battles, instead of pushing them out first, they decide to push further into Mexico on the same front line. That lack of direction is horrific because as Texas, this is my capital state. If they invade it slightly, it doesn't matter if I take all this land here, I'm going to take down fast than they are because they own a sliver and I could be beating them constantly in, in battle after battle. But because I can't tell my guys, hey, clear out this lot first, or because they don't do it automatically, I'll lose the war overall. And that's something I don't like. I, I appreciate the pirates have tried to have like a hands-off um, 
approach to generals and warfare and that sort of thing. But in my opinion, they've kind of gone 50-50. You can't simultaneously have, hey, go and do this very specific naval invasion, um, HQ is going to be here, and have a degree of control like that at the same time as being hands-off because it just leaves you frustrated because you can't tell your troops where to go properly. You can only push them in that vague direction. And I think that there is a, and I'll come on to this until when I talk about diplomacy, I think there is a limited amount of things that you can do to interact with other nations diplomatically Meaning warfare is one of the most satisfying things to do in the game, or at least it is like an interesting thing to do more than anything else. And so you've got this really nasty balance of not being able to get the full experience because you can only, like I said, generally push generals in that direction and set up all the modifiers, but at the same time it being quite, uh, still quite a relevant part of the game. So it's, it's kind of hard to balance and the front lines, like how they're implemented and stuff are so broken that it makes it super frustrating. It's fun when it works and you're like holding off hordes of people attacking you and you've got all the modifiers and you're doing really well, but it's kind of ridiculous. Also, the amount of casualties from wounded versus battles is ridiculous as well, I think. Like just from attrition. Although I appreciate again, that's for balancing. So you've got to remember when making a video game you can't just do everything that you think sounds cool it has to balance as well uh, and that's kind of the part that as consumers it's harder for us to relate so it's important to keep that in mind again looking at a satisfying thing right now if i switch over to the us we have only this to look at right the barracks and that shows us we've got 45 offense and 50 defense there's nothing really flavorful about that at all there's no military doctrines. There's nothing like that. If I went to recruit a new general, it's just a random two with random traits. And again, going back to that point about culture I made, it would be more interesting that, for example, if as Texas, I was constantly fighting defensive wars against Mexico or the US, having doctrines that I could select or having a culture that would emerge that focuses on defense or I have the option to purely focus on defense because that's what we do as Texas. We hold the line. I think that's a way more interesting. Suddenly it opens up way more um, options in terms of sort of the more tactical uh, balance of things. Right now, just picking two leaders from a leader pool and they don't refresh unless they someone dies or you fire them. It, I, I really don't like it. One of my favorite events in this game is an event where you get an admiral uh, from a guy that just survives a bunch of whaling, whaling ships. And I, that is awesome. I really enjoy that. It's a dynamic event. Well, it's not really dynamic, but it's an event that occurs that has flavor to it. And so you have a, an attachment to that admiral more than anyone else. Also, Britain, for example, might want to focus more on a naval doctrine that favors one thing or another. Um, think like uh, Hoi 4 with the different bonuses, but a little bit more simplified uh, than going down a, a research tree. I think that would, that would go so far. I personally think that above a lot of other things in this list, beyond like fixes, that has to be implemented in the game because that would be a really, really interesting thing. Like if you were playing as um, Canada and your main thing is like avoiding attrition and conserving your manpower, or you're playing as Russia and it's all about as many men on the front line as possible. Those differences matter and it means that going back to that first point I made about nations being interchangeable, it's not that scary. Like for example, if Russia has a colonial venture against me, I'm not scared because I know that their army favors quantity. It's gonna be difficult for them to ship that quantity of that amount of troops on me. Um, but for example, if I share a land border with them, I'm going to be terrified that the hordes of Russians are gonna come pouring over because it doesn't matter about my stats. They're just gonna murder me if they can get there in enough numbers. Uh, and then I have to plan accordingly. That suddenly, you've got a load more interactions, a load more flavor, and a load more dy uh, dynamism, which is so key for this game. And again, that internal player culture forms, where you're like, I've held this province for this many years, I'm going to be holding it for the rest of time against my eternal enemy of the Russians. Creating storylines is crucial, and that is a, a huge part of it. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, is like the UI and uh, the, I suppose the more graphical elements. Firstly, the game is... I know a lot of people like, for example, my good friend Redhawk hates uh, transparent maps, like with a passion. He hates maps where, where you zoom in, the color disappears, but I quite like them. So he's wrong and an idiot, but I digress. Congrats on 100K. <laughs> so the first thing to mention is that it's a really clean UI, but it's clean at the cost of sort of hiding crucial information. I find myself a lot of the time uh, trying to find things by clicking action lock and then action lock and then action lock uh, versus it just being on a tab. And I think that in my humble opinion, Paradox have oversimplified this. Also, this is, I hate this. <laughs> the trade route thing, I would never use these two ever. Um, I only ever use the market ones because like having buttons that don't fit fully on screen doesn't make any sense to me. Same thing with the diplomatic plays and diplomatic actions. I really don't like this. I, I wish it was, it was more of a list 
or, or something different, this just doesn't work. I don't like the drag up menu. It kind of works for this, but it makes it feel like a mobile game. <laughs> Not the worst thing in the world, just a personal gripe. More importantly though, uh, the pop-ups. You get weird pop-ups for things that don't matter, like people spamming you with notifications or rejections of things. But important things like decisions, like for example, reviving the Olympic Games, um, or as Japan, like a whaling thing, and I give that specific example because Arcanus, one of the, uh, the moderators of the entire channel, uh, has, has voiced his concerns with it, so I thought I'd throw him a bone and actually complain about it on his behalf. Playing Japan for the first time, he's got about 60, 70 minutes in the game, I uh, played a lot of Victoria 2 and didn't know that the whaling decision was a thing just because he wasn't constantly looking for it and it didn't pop up. Decisions and that sort of thing should pop up, other stuff, not really. So looking on a more like individual level, uh, this is something that I despise. Uh, the, the units looking like this and just shooting each other like this is, I, I don't like it. Right now, these artillery pieces, that's fine. That's, that's, that's looking great. But someone please tell me why there are just villages shooting each other. I thought when I first played this, it was pre-release. Uh, and I thought that this was like temporary. I thought it was a graphical glitch. Stupid. <laughs> They're not even shooting for anything. It's just a, a, a couple of villages that just light up. So it's little things like this that could uh, do with a bit of bit of rework. I do enjoy like the flame borders. Uh, I think that looks really cool. Uh, also a side note when... Uh, you're nipping into a nation, right? You push forward and this happens. I like, I'm torn. I kind of like the fact that your flag appears, but I think it should be just like one big flag potentially that you unve unveil. I don't like the lots of looped flags over and over again. I think it looks a bit janky. So uh, another thing is the kids are always dressed up even when they're age eight, sure, but age zero, they're always dressed up and it's just a bit strange. <laughs> We're at the minor gripe section. <laughs> the graphical and UI stuff, not as important as the core gameplay, but I thought uh, it's important to some, so I thought I'd mention it. Moving on to markets. So for example, if I'm playing as Tunis, as I have done several times, as you well know on this channel, um, I get a lot of the stick for how much I play Tunis. If I, as Tunis, were to generate electricity, or for example, have transport uh, in this province, then I share a market with the Ottomans and they will go ahead and suck it all up. Which is very strange considering we have no cables or batteries or anything else like that, nor any reason why transport should be a transferable uh, resource. For example, you can't trade those things. It's strange that as the Ottomans, you can just take that from me. But that's only the sort of the tip of the iceberg when it comes to weird things in markets. If I right now were to declare independence from the Ottomans, I would be at war with them, which is, you know, pretty standard, fair enough. But I'd also still be part of their market up until the war ended. Uh, I did this before as Texas declaring war on the Mexico on the Americans, and also as Tunis declaring war as the Ottomans. But it's kind of strange that they'll produce grain and my people will consume it. And I'm not immediately kicked out of the market. Um, I remember one private variant said something to me about it having a reason mechanically and there was it was better than the alternative. But for me, I think whilst obviously I'll, I'll agree with whatever that guy says, he's way smarter than I am. Uh, it feels strange and I can't, I don't like it. <laughs> Especially when it comes to weird stuff like getting blockaded. Um, I'll be affected if the Ottomans are blockaded even if they're blockaded by my ally, which is kind of weird. Now back to the beautiful blue world uh, for my next gripe, which is look at how much coal is available here. Spain are my subject, full subject, not just part of my market, but you know, that's, that's fine. Um, and this sort of straddles the points of market and diplomacy that I want to bring up, but I can't build any coal mines here. This was a particular frustration in my recent game as Tunis, where I went into uh, Carthage and formed Carthage because all I ever needed was coal. And I was forced to conquer this province and also the province down here in Portugal in order to secure coal. There was no peaceful way of me securing a resource at all. And I think that if the game and, and developers want to prioritize economic development and trying to manage the markets versus warfare, then you have to enable things like foreign uh, direct investment. I should be able to build uh, coal mines, provided that nation's trade laws allow it, I should be able to be able to build coal mines and then reap the benefits from it. Uh, otherwise, I'm forced to conquer those promises. Uh, also, most recently in my Siam video, uh, which was a couple of days ago, I had to find a source of sulfur. I ended up conquering uh, Louisiana because I needed a source of, of, uh, of, of, sulf of sulfur. I didn't have a choice because I had no way of importing it because no one was producing it. And again, it's different if that nation is on isolationist or something like that. But again, we start to see more interesting dynamics form whereby I will, as for example, Tunis, keep Spain super friendly because I want to develop their coal mines. I won't necessarily try and enforce my will on them because I just want their coal. I'm happy to be friends with them. And equally, Spain wants all that investment. So it creates this really nice um, informal economic partnership 
that isn't enforced through trade deals or common markets or anything else like that. We just have that kind of a, a special relationship. Uh, that also opens up a lot of mechanics with regards to how that would take place in terms of special laws, in terms of, um, okay, I'll build coal mines in you and you get the uh, revenue, but I get the resource. The, the, this kind of stuff would be really, really interesting and again provides new avenues for interactions with other nations and therefore depth of flavor. But as it stands, if Spain doesn't build this coal mine and they won't, they just, uh, then I stop. <laughs> Simple as that, I can't grow economically and I have to attack Spain, which I don't want to do. Like playing, weird is, as weird as it sounds, Unless you're a major nation with already uh, loads of access to other resources, you can't play tall in this game. I know that's going to sound like sacrilege because this is basically a playing tall simulator as people keep on pointing out, but I disagree completely. I think this game forces you to hit a cap and once you hit that cap because you need more resources or whether it be population or uh, natural resources, you then need to go and conquer for them because you don't have access to, any to anything else. You have to do it. Uh, otherwise, you'll just sit there at that cap and everyone else will either catch up or surpass you. So the first thing I want to mention with diplomacy is, uh, and I'll use an early Tunis game of mine as a backdrop, uh, is the great power system. I'm currently ranked 29th. I'm an unrecognized regional power that has the 8th largest GDP in the world and number 1 in GDP per capita. I'm also number 1 in current standard of living. My people are the um, best fed, They and also as a nation I'm one of the richest. And yet, I don't matter, I'm number 29th, which doesn't make any sense at all, I should be able to project some sort of power to it. Uh, secondly, I'm then capped, uh, I'm only allowed to be maximum 28 because I am technically a subject of France because of this customs union thing. So that's already weird, in my opinion, but crucially, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm the number 29th great power, it doesn't matter if I'm an actual great power, I think this great power system down here is just more for the player's benefit. Like me being ranked 29th doesn't matter, I can... You can sit here and say, for example, Wallachia is a higher power, is a more important power than Tunis. But it doesn't really make any sense whatsoever. But again, it doesn't matter because it's not like it can do anything. Why do you need to be a great power? Well, you can get these strategic interests. Are useful, but not useful to the point of like, desperately needing to be a great power. So I think that that might need a rework um, in terms of how it does. How that would take place, I don't know. Uh, this is where I'd love for, to read the comments and see what everyone says and where uh, my own limitations uh, come into play because I can identify that, hey, I don't like this system. What do you want to do about it? Is 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 a horrible, horrible answer to the question. So I want to come up with some sort of suggestions. So these are what you currently get for great uh, powers. You get a minus 50% loan interest rate. That's good. Influence, declared interests, and maneuvers. I've never had an issue with influence at all. Maximum declared interest is, is okay and 100 maneuvers is decent. But that's not going to matter because we're going to segue into my next point. Uh, it's this. It's a stupid system. <laughs> Diplomatic plays. Um, I, I say that just to grab your attention because I think they actually work and I think they work well. But one thing I don't like is if I'm, for example, the US and I'm trying to enforce my will on Mexico, as has clearly happened in this game. That's what the AI is trying to uh, do. If I conquer a state here and I am too powerful, like you can see that I am here. I can add all the war goals in the world. I can be like, okay, right, we'll, we want uh, Mexican Oklahoma as well. And uh, we want war operations. And we're going to go ahead and grab ourselves. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna subjugate Nicaragua and ask him to revoke claims. Like, this is going to be such a great war for me. What we'll see at the end of it is that the Mexicans will most definitely back down, as you can see there. So what have I gained out of that? Well, only one province out of the things that I wanted. And now I have to suffer through a five-year truce uh, for taking one province. So it's, it's incredibly hard unless your primary war goal is something like create a subject to do anything. If I'm a, a number one great power that is so far above the number six great power and I try and enforce my will on them by... I, I want to dismantle them, I want to take a province, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do the other, and they just back down. I'm forced to only chip away at one province at a time with a five-year truce. This is very unsatisfying to me. I think if you have the infamy to burn, or if you're that much more powerful or something like that, then it should be you should have the option to take all of it, or to take one or two, or to deliver an ultimatum. Because the fact that they can almost get away with just giving away one province is, is kind of ridiculous, because you saw the sheer quantity of things that I wanted to do to Mexico in that war, and I was geared up for it, and now I can't do them for another five years. And inevitably, when I try and do that again, if I want to like eat up this one little province here of Mexico and Oklahoma, which he is surrounded, they're all starving, he can't do anything with, it'll be another five-year truce. So across 10 years, I can only take two provinces from Mexico. And that's it, I can't do anything else. And that irks me a bit. So I think having adjustable truces, having the ability to break those truces, having the ability to spend infamy uh, to, to, to force through an issue would be so much better. Or even to go to hell with it, I'm going straight to war anyway. So the fact that it's only your first one, 
I don't like. Going further in terms of your interactions with another nation, in my opinion, the, there is no real way to punish a nation economically. There's no real way to rival a nation economically. For a game that doesn't want to emphasize war, the only way for you to hurt a nation is through warfare. Uh, and I could be wrong here. Maybe I'm playing the game completely wrong. I could be wrong on a lot of these things. That's why I want any people to, to comment and tell me. But there's not much that anyone can do. The, the only thing they can do is, is if I hit 100 infamy, they can cut me down to size and try and get everyone to pile in. But that rarely happens, especially if you're careful. But right now, if I wanted to, for example, fight the British, because we're hostile, but I don't want to challenge them head on because I'm trying to play taller or I'm doing something like that. Uh, the only thing I can do realistically is embargo them, which I already have done. And it's not going to affect their economy and it's not, it's not going to affect mine. And a lot of the times the AI tends to just lift the, that embargo immediately afterwards anyway, after a couple of years. So for the most part, it doesn't matter. Like It's not like I, I can look at their... Um, main export, which let's say it is fish. Let's say the British, for whatever reason, they've regressed to a very primary based, resource based economy and they go for fish. It's not like I'm going to go, okay, right. So now I'm going to tank the world price of fish by producing a load and giving it out and tanking the British economy. It doesn't really work like that in this game, um, as far as I've been able to control at least. And so you're, you're kind of left with this unsatisfactory uh, Position where the only way to punish a nation is warfare, but you can't wield warfare effectively. Now, spot the difference with me. Make vassal. Some of these guys are my puppets, some of these guys are my vassals. Can you tell which is which? Absolutely not, because I lied to you. Aside from some personal unions, they're all my puppets. There is no discernible difference between vassals and puppets. Like, let me show you. A vassal, you have to pay 15% of your treasury. You have to pay 20%, and a dominion, you pay 10%. And you're able to start start your own laws and uh, wars, and you don't have to join the, your overlords' wars. But beyond that, there is no difference. There is no reason why you would do a vassal instead of a puppet. None. I've not been able to see one. There is there are very few interactions that you can have with people. So you've got your dominions, puppets, and vassals, all of whom are basically interchangeable, uh, apart from dominions who are just worse. And then you've got people who are in your market who you protect and are part of your market. But aside from that nothing else and then you have tributaries which is the same as a dominion or developed nations and that's kind of unsatisfying to me the fact that you can't really have any variants i mean stellaris with their like new vassal uh, dynamics which i think was a really really innovative thing to do you can have different relationships with different nations i think that would be kind of a really interesting thing to do here equally the only way to integrate so spain for example is loyal to me they have 250 relations that's great they were the first puppet that i had they're lovely like that we, we get on great love the guy to bits but i can't annex him because we're too friendly to annex him which doesn't make sense it's the inverse of, for example if you think of eu4 you have to have 190 relations to annex a subject so they are willingly becoming part of your uh realm here, they have to hate you and you have to annex them. And to me, I don't like that. The fact that there's no way for you to peacefully integrate a nation beyond expelling the diplomats, making them hate you, ruining tens of years of, uh, of shared interests and, and helping each other out economically and militarily, and then just... And then you're going to have to deal with radicals from conquest and that sort of stuff. I think I should be able to integrate these guys and have them be a part of me, especially if I'm like a multicultural sort of like... Uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité sort of sort of state. Like in wars, for example, you can uh, do both giving them war reparations in return for taking territory, which I like. It's rarely used, but I like that that's a thing that you can do. And I think there should be a little bit of a give and take on the uh, subjects and, and overlord interactions as well. Have subjects that hate you and chafe under your rule, but you force them into it. Think like uh, Prussia and Austria under the French uh, back in Napoleonic times um, versus a more amicable hierarchy that then develops into, okay, well, we're just going to merge nations. However, the there are other things that you can do in terms of diplomatic actions that are mildly interesting. For example, I can take on someone's debt. They rarely accept this, but if I were to do this, they would give me an obligation. What does an obligation do? Well, it basically, ha you use a bit of leverage. Think like, again, a favor in, in Crusader Kings. But it's really one-dimensional and it can mean anything. Uh, and I don't like that system at all. Like, it makes sense. We've done you a favor, you do me a favor, and you can reject an obligation at huge cost to uh, yourself and your infamy. But it's, but again, it just feels really limited in scope. The only thing that you can do is have this like universal uh, IOU on a piece of paper instead of it being a bit more dynamic, like, oh, we get to uh, influence your laws. We get to change this, we get to change that. You could also increase the dynamism uh, with that. For example, we could be become the like the Franco-Spanish union. You know, Austria becomes Austria-Hungary, for example. Uh, I don't see why you shouldn't be able to integrate that or become a federation or, or that sort of stuff but i'll 
talk about more of that when it comes to governments. Uh, one thing I want to touch on that mixes diplomacy and governancy throughout this entire thing, I've cleverly linked together points that move into the next section, is, for example, in return for this obligation, I could then uh, change your laws, like I mentioned, uh, or uh, I could influence you directly to try and have you have uh, the laws that I want you to have. Or I can, for example, bribe your generals, or I can try and interfere in your internal workings. Because right now, the way that it's structured is, I'm France, I have these internal things going on, right? My laws, my government, my uh, my institutions. Then that builds up the nation of France, which interacts with the nation of Britain or the nation of Spain or the nation of Tunis, which isn't really how it worked because you can influence actors directly. You see this, for example, right now, if you look at this, you can see people taking sides based on Croatian revolt and uh, Croatia, which is great. But only when there's a civil war can you influence a nation directly. There are some events that are tied to offering an obligation, uh, such as like signing of unequal treaties, um, which, or a nation like tries to enforce a law on you uh, with their obligations, a random event. But it's just, it's, it's, those are the only two examples that I can think of. And it takes away a huge aspect to this, which is if I'm a big, strong nation, right? Or if I'm Tunis and I am a smaller but rich nation, like here, I'm not the biggest nation in the world, but I have a lot of money and specifically my, my guys are well paid then I think I should be able to influence Sicily. You know, break away, like get them to break away from a market or I can start to have some sort of um, influence in their generals. I think there is a distinct lack of any sort of espionage system, uh, which I believe is taking away a huge potential aspect of this game. If I could influence a nation through money or, or cultural means, it would make things like playing tool so much more satisfying because you can sort of puppet master things. It gives you a reason to not go to war because it's safer to sit back, make your money, and start gently pushing things that you want to happen on the world stage from behind the scenes. Obviously, huge ramifications, and you don't want it to be like, aha, I click this one button and that nation goes boom. But you do want uh, something like, okay, I'm gonna start to give a lot of money to uh, the intelligentsia, because I want them to open up the uh, markets, and, and right now that'll do it. Or for example, if I'm looking at Japan, which is typically uh, in this case has been occupied by France, but is typically isolationist. I can try and inc increase the amount of intelligentsia or give funds to this lot to try and pursue a revolt or pursue a uh, change in that nation because it will open up their markets, which is better for me as an economic uh, powerhouse and, and suits me. And instead of just saying, aha, diplomatic play, open up market, because that's a military thing. And for a game that, like I said, is trying to pivot away from military, it makes it necessary to have a strong one. Now, looking at these internal laws that we have going on, uh, this is one of my biggest gripes. I've said that a lot. Um, I, I, I enjoy this game, I promise. This is basically a, a video essay on, hey, here's everything I don't like about this game, whilst trying to reassure you that I actually really do like the game. That's why I started off the video by saying, hey, I probably have more hours than damn near everyone else, which you wouldn't be able to tell by the way I play. But yeah, it's the same thing. It's you get rid of serfdom, you change your economic system to agrarianism, and then you try and pursue per capita taxation to give you some funds. From there, you try and change your laws to try and get the landowners out, so you change your try and get some suffrage um, or wealth voting. If you're able to, you switch out from a monarchy if you want to. It's not That's not really that important. Um, you grab yourself some religious schools, uh, and then from there, you're basically good. You don't really need to change anything else, but if you can ban slavery, you want to. If you want to, this sort of thing. It follows the same path. There's no real reason to not go down a path. And so whether you play as, and this is the biggest issue, if I play as Tunis or Tripolitania or Brazil or Ecuador, in terms of the domestic laws, they're basically the same. The only real bit of flavor is when you play as Siam or Japan and you're isolationist and you start out like that, which is why those nations are probably my favorite to play because you're isolated and it's fun. If I'm playing as Tunis, there's no difference to Tunis and Morocco. Only Morocco has more resources and is an easier start. There's nothing like dynamic that happens during the game that would make me shift my laws one way or another because the laws are fundamentally, this one is better than the other. Like realistically, apart from maybe some issues with authority, which again, doesn't really matter, you might as well go multiculturalism. There's no reason to having migrate like um, closed borders. There's no reason to not increasing the uh, taxation to proportional taxation. There's, there's, it means that you play the same game Unless you inject your own flavor to it, you basically, in terms of the internal politics, you play the same game every time. Um, and that is very frustrating. From an economics point of view, you play the same economic game every single time. Switches us over real nicely to the fact that in the industry, paddle card. <laughs> um, there's, again, little variance. If I start off as Tunis or I start off anywhere else, 
Here's what you do first thing. In fact, I'll show you live. Start a new game and I'll play as a nation that I have never played as before. Who have I never played as? Right, first things you do is you check out what resources you have. Okay, I've got coal, iron. Yeah, this is easy, easy, easy nation to play as because if you have logs, coal and iron you then just basically want to create steel as quickly as possible so pretty much you build a bunch of coal build a bunch of iron build a bunch of logging camps then you build either textile mills or furniture industries then tooling then steel mills it's the same thing each time uh i've i've sometimes messed around with shipyards when i'm pursuing ironclads that's sometimes a bit different and i'm pretty sure i've mentioned it every time but that's all you do there's there's nothing different now if i switch over to the only difference is that I'm not going to have um, any iron mines, right? So we're going to import iron. Okay, so instead I import iron and I focus more on that side of things. But I still do furniture, I still do textile, and I still try and build up a steel industry because that's what it is. So you go through this sort of cycle of, okay, I'm going to expand this up until my infrastructure is full and then I build a railway and then I expand more. There's nothing really else to it. And whilst early game, it requires a bit of attention to try and basically min-max it. Late game, you just spam out buildings. If you've ever watched me play, um, you'll notice that there's a lot of content right at the start in the first half. And then the la in the latter half, it's a lot of um, time skips because you just set your things to build. And then I'll typically like chill on my phone or I'll go up and I'll go to the bathroom. And I'll then I'll come back and things have been built. And that's not interesting um, to me. There are some slight differences. So for example, this one has plus 15% agricultural throughput. This one over here has uh, Indo-Chinese forests. That's all well and good. But one thing that people wanted, and this was something that was on the community post, so let me read it to make sure I get it right, is that they wanted um, vertical integration. So what that means is basically if I have here in Tunis, which I don't have, but let's say I had iron and coal, uh, I build iron and coal there, and then I produce a steel mill in that same state, then that mill will get a bonus to its throughput because it has uh, domestic sources of coal and iron close by. Uh, this was a feature, for example, of Victoria 2. So why do I bring that up as an example? Well, the reason I bring that up is because right now there is no reason to plan out your economy that thoughtfully when it comes to where it's located. If I switch over to France and show you that, it's literally just where the population is. If I want to build a cooling workshop these are all the same you can see even by the predicted predicted uh, earnings right they're all the same the only thing you, is the difference is the amount of population you just need to have population to it and revisiting the idea of culture one thing that would be really interesting is that if i built up Brittany to be this powerhouse and you kind of have it with uh, economies of scale but if i built up Brittany for the next 30 years they build tools and they build it well there should be a bonus to that state for tools because that's all they know they grow up making tools they die making tools and that's who they are uh, an example of this can be seen in history if you look at the difference between British and French uh, gunners, right, or Spanish gunners. The British were a lot of sailors were, were faster than the Spanish. Were they, you know, genetically gifted uh, or, or more skilled or put in more hours of training? The first two, no, they may be putting in more hours of training, but a lot of that, um, and I can cite a couple of papers that I may, um, if I can be bothered to go and go and... Uh, Fine, but it's not, I'm not trying to make a historical point here, so I don't really feel the need. But I can reference my, my, <laughs> my sources if I need to. But there are interesting uh, papers written showing that it was more, and it shows the impact of culture on uh, those speeds. The British were faster, oftentimes because, obviously there are other factors as well, because they had the tradition of the Royal Navy and protecting their island and, and this sort of stuff. And that manifested, because that's what humans do, right? We do something we take pride in it and so we pass that down to our children who then do it from an early age and want to do it better because uh that's something that is part of the cultural her heritage of that area and i think that if you start to see that in states like look we produce fantastic wet wine here or champagne right i mean look at the uh the and this is going to be such a weird way to make my point but look at parmesan cheese right they're very uh, enthusiastic about it. There's a, an Australian guy called the, I can't remember what it's called, but he um, he always starts his videos with uh, Good day, curd nerds. Um, and it's just a bunch of Italians in the comments, just what well, there were previously until Reddit saw it, um, like hating on him because he was calling his cheese a certain type of cheese, like I think it was Parmesan, um, when it wasn't made there. And that is the point I'm trying to get across. If you can make a state so one dimensional, so focused on one industry, then I think that that should be prevalent. You should get a modifier saying like, hey, pff, look at this. We get a, 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 a percentage modifier to um, to tools here. And then let's say you get that with coal or you get that with um, an industry that is going to die out over time because you don't need it anymore. Then suddenly all well, these guys take a lot of pride in it 
when that because they take so much pride in it, when that factory falls or fail, fails or anything else, it becomes a, a big source of political agitation. And again, now you have these internal dynamics of you're thinking, okay, well, Normandy is my big hub for uh, for shipyards. If I build them in Aquitaine, maybe the Normandy guys get upset. Maybe there's a rivalry between the two. Maybe there's no more migration between Aquitaine and uh, and Normandy because they don't like each other because they're rivals for shipbuilding. These kinds of dynamics are incredibly hard to develop mechanically in the game. I will appreciate that. It's, uh, what I'm saying is not an easy thing to code, I would imagine, because I have very little experience. I'm just trying to put out ideas that maybe we can take uh, a tangential thing from and go, okay, that's kind of cool. Um, so there are scales to this. So level one being, okay, if for X amount of years you get a modifier um, for your throughput because it's been that way for so long. Creating dynamic rivalries and political agitation for when you remove those factories is going to be a lot harder. But again, anything that increased dynamism would be a lot of um, uh, would be a lot of fun because if an industry dies out over time or you're getting outcompeted elsewhere, then subsidizing that factory for political reasons, you have a reason to keep that factory around instead of letting it die. And I think that would make things a lot cooler to handle on the home front, especially in the late game. Whew, right, I think that those are all of my like thoughts that I have <laughs> at the forefront of my uh, of my head. Um, I want to reiterate by saying that I enjoy this game. I like this game. I think it's a good game and I think it's fun. I know a lot of people don't like it. I personally do. I will continue to play it. I'll continue to make videos on it. Um, and I, I thoroughly enjoy it. These are some things that I think can be changed to make the game a lot better. It is also really worth, as I've said throughout this entire thing, worth noting that this is an early release. Paradox, how they work is they create um, a game and then they build on top of it and it's a platform that comes from, that, is, that works for years to come. I don't want this game to end up like Imperator. Uh, <laughs> I really don't. I, I enjoy it and I think it could be a really stable platform to build off of, um, provided some changes are made. And I think that as a, and this is going to sound uh, a little bit cheesy, but as a, as a community, I think that we have an obligation to try and make suggestions and make um, things known that we think would be beneficial in the game, even if they suck, even if they're bad ideas, even if they're not mechanically possible, in my case, uh, to try and prolong or extend the game's life and try and make it better. Um, I think that if we sort of throw our hands up and go, well, front lines are broken and then walk away from the game, I think there's no chance of it getting fixed. So with that having been said, make sure to, in the comments down below, write your thoughts. Put down what you think will uh, improve the game, what ideas you think would make it worse, what you like, what you dislike, these kinds of things. And try and make them a bit more insightful than warfare bad. Because, I don't know, I'm kind of sick to death of, of things on Twitter on um, Discord, on YouTube comments, and people just like mashing out in all caps, but warfare bad, um, and then they go about their day without offering anything sort of more um, substantial. That's what I've spent this video trying to do, which is oh, highlight what I think are issues, and I could be wrong. Um, I'd be very happy to hear that I'm wrong, um, and then try and offer some sort of solution to it. But it's my hope that this video gets seen by a decent chunk of people and sort of gets the ball rolling on on feedback, because uh, I think that's a crucial part for any game. Uh, I think one thing that's kept EU4 alive after all these years is a community that genuinely cares. It's a good side, a bad side. If the developers mess up, then the community is going to hate that. But on the flip side, it's that sort of passion and vitriol that will then hopefully info like reinforce any good things and also make suggestions uh, to change the things that are bad. So am I a complete idiot? Uh, if so, make sure to subscribe. If I'm not, if you agree with me, make sure to subscribe. That way, I win either way. Um, and let me know what you think of the format of the video. Uh, like I said, I was planning on doing this more scripted, but I thought it being more free-flowing would be easier to listen to and engage with. And then hopefully I leave a lot of like potholes open for people to attack myself and my character. Uh, so yeah, if you want more of these kinds of videos, I'll be more than happy to do it, because I have a lot of thoughts on a lot of the games. Because <laughs> at my core, I'm good at complaining. Oh, man. Otherwise, boys, I will see you all next time. Goodbye. Huge shout out to our patrons, most notably Charlie Demorel, Krilly, Flyerton, JDow52, Cargon, Xiaomi, Lewis Wright, Nicole's Christ, QA Shard, Redguard, and Shadow Singer. Your support means a lot, guys. Whilst you're here, you might as well click on another video. I mean, it's, it's literally right there.